Welcome to Chapter 6, Metabolism. I put in parentheses here, and energy, because when it comes down to it, metabolism is all about making and using energy. This is the first lesson from Chapter 6. So all of life is energy dependent. And each of the characteristics of living systems, which we have talked about before, metabolism, reproduction, growth and development, homeostasis, requires a constant supply of energy. The interaction of living systems, in fact, is merely an exchange of energy. I love this image here because here we see this carnivore, this apex predator, feeding on this herbivore, this giraffe, and this image encompasses everything that this chapter is all about. So we have the grass back here which receives its energy from the sun. The giraffe feeds, among other things, upon this grass. That's where the giraffe, the herbivore, gets its energy. And then the lion feeds upon the herbivore. The lion is a carnivore, obviously, feeding upon the herbivore. And it's from there that the lion gets its energy. So if you think about what's going on here, everything in this very simple food chain ultimately receives its energy from the sun. We'll talk about that and the degree of energy that passes from one level to the next as we get into this chapter. All right, so the objectives of this chapter are to find energy and differentiate potential, kinetic, free, and activation energy. There's a lot going on here in this chapter. Describe the flow of energy in living systems state the two laws of thermodynamics, define ATP, that's adenosine triphosphate, which you already know a little bit about, describe its usefulness to living systems, define enzyme, which you also know a little bit about at this point, and describe their usefulness in biochemical reactions, and define metabolism and describe its purpose with regard to cell function. Now you've seen this image before of this little person up here getting ready to push this boulder or this large ball down the hill. Now while this ball sits on top of the hill, it is full of potential energy. Remember, potential energy is stored energy. Once the ball is rolled over the edge and gravity takes over and the ball rolls down the hill. Now we have energy in motion. We call that kinetic energy. While the ball sits on top of the hill, it can potentially do something, do some kind of work. As it's rolling downhill, releasing its energy, energy in motion, it can then do work. Uh, you can roll over um, a car, uh, <laughs> a line of people. It's, it's energy in motion, okay? And once it gets to the bottom of the hill and it stops, then we're back to zero. No potential, no kinetic. Okay, so here's a quick check. And my, my thought for you here is the energy stored in the pyrophosphate bonds of ATP, adenosine triphosphate, is what kind of energy? I'll let you think about that for a second. Your choices are kinetic energy, free energy, potential energy, and Gibbs energy. Okay, so remember that 
we're talking about stored energy right stored energy and any kind of energy that is stored is potential energy it is energy that can potentially do work or be used to do work so if you answered potential you're absolutely correct so recall you've seen this illustration before as well as as electrons move away from the nucleus here's the nucleus of an atom as electrons move from one energy shell to the next away from the nucleus their potential energy increases so that an electron way out here in the outer shell can potentially do a lot of work there's a lot of power stored in that electron and it can be it can interact with um, the electrons of an adjacent atom and form a molecule okay by the same token the reverse is true as electrons move from energy shell down closer to the nucleus and it's not really an up down this illustration merely illustrates that as you get closer to the nucleus the potential energy of that electron goes down or decreases and that idea will be forever uh, important for you to remember as you study biology okay thermodynamics so thermodynamics merely pertains to heat exchanges there's whole classes in physics and um, on thermodynamics and we're not interested in all of the details of thermodynamics but we are interested in the first and second laws of thermodynamics because they play important parts in organic systems so energy is mechanical heat uh, or can be mechanical energy heat energy like from the Sun sound energy electric energy light radioactivity is also energy energy is measured in units of heat because all other forms of energy mechanical sound electric light etc can be confer can be converted to heat so thermodynamics pertains to heat exchanges and we have two laws to concern ourselves with the first law of thermodynamics states that energy is neither created nor destroyed it merely changes form so we do not make energy we cannot break energy it just changes form like from the Sun to the grass to the giraffe to the lion it's going from source to source it changes sources or changes form but it never you but we never create it or never destroy it heat is measured in kilocalories energy is measured in units of heat that is the kilocalorie kilo means 1000 so 1000 calories that's the kcal or, or lowercase kcal one kilocalorie is a thousand calories now one calorie is the amount of heat required to raise the temperature of one gram of water one degree celsius so it's a one 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 uh proposition here one calorie the amount of heat required because remember energy is measured in heat units and one heat unit is a calorie so one calorie is the amount of heat required to raise the temperature of one gram of water one degree celsius so it's a it's a one 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 proposition so ecosystems get their energy from the sun ultimately all energy comes from the sun at the rate of 40 million billion calories per second now plants and algae and some bacteria conduct photosynthesis and I think you're familiar with that term from uh, 10th grade biology or 7th grade um, life science that photosynthesis is where light is absorbed from the energy and turned into 
chemical energy. And that's what photosynthesis is. Synthesis, we're synthesizing something using photo, which is, pertains to light. So photosynthesis converts light energy from the sun into chemical energy. And light energy is stored as potential energy in the covalent bonds of glucose. And we'll see that process, especially as we get into cellular respiration. So remember redox reactions. Redox reactions transfer electrons from one molecule to another. It's a combination or it's the pair of reduction and oxidation reactions. Remember, we don't have a reduction reaction in an org organic system without a, um, an accompanying oxidation reaction. So what happens here in a reduction reaction, remember that a molecule gains an electron. It becomes, it gains an electron, so it becomes more negative or less positive. It's reduced from a from a more positive position to a more negative position. It gets reduced. Its elect electrical charge gets reduced. Whereas with an oxidation reaction, a molecule, a molecule loses an electron and therefore becomes more positive. So reduction increases the potential energy, right? Because we're, if we, if we gain an electron and become more negative, right? We're gaining an electron. And so now we have an extra electron now that can uh, interact with another molecule in the milieu, right? So it becomes more potentially reactive, increases potential energy. And so here we see that in this little diagram here, where A loses an electron and becomes a more positive, thereby being oxidized, and B gains an electron, therefore becoming more negative, and is thus reduced. Now, thermodynamics, again, the total amount of energy in the universe is constant. So again, you don't make energy. We do not make energy. We do not destroy energy. It simply changes form. The first law of thermodynamics, as we've said already, uh, energy is neither created nor destroyed. It merely changes form. And the energy in living systems, you know this now, is stored in chemical bonds. So energy flows only in one direction, that is from the sun, from the sun to the grass, to the giraffe, to the lion. As living systems do work, only a fraction of the energy is used. Most of that energy is released as heat. Think about it when you exercise. When you exercise, you're running or walking on the treadmill or doing this, doing uh, aerobics or whatever you that uses a lot of energy obviously but what happens in the process you begin to perspire you sweat a lot you get hot you sweat a lot you have to drink water that is energy being released as heat and interestingly only a small fraction of the energy that you take in gets used for the exercise. Most of it is released as heat. Okay, so the second law of thermodynamics, or right, first law, energy neither created nor destroyed. Second law of thermodynamics, as energy in a system we're talking about decreases, the degree of disorder increases. And disorder we refer to as entropy. Entropy. All right, so as energy decreases, in other words, as you work, as you do the exercise, the degree of disorder, entropy increases. And think about it with regard to the exercise um, illustration that I just used, right? You're running on the treadmill or you're running a marathon, you're using a lot of energy, you build up a lot of heat, you start to perspire, 
and what happens you get tired your muscles get sore uh, you get winded you get hot that's entropy all right when 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 you go from when you go from beyond your homeostatic balance that is you get hot you get tired your muscles get sore you get winded it's hard to breathe that's disorder right when everything is in order when you're in homeostatic balance you're calm cool and collected you're breathing easy you're relaxed you feel good there's no aches and pains but when you go run the marathon you start to have aches and pains and you get tired and your muscles get sore okay that's disorder that's entropy so think about it like this entropy is amount of disorder or randomness in a system so ice we're talking about water right ice the solid form of water uh, represents the maximum order with regard to water right the maximum degree of water you can't go anywhere if your ice right ice is solid there it is immovable water then liquid water is the maximum degree of disorder and so as ice here in this glass starts to melt right this is solid ice maximum order as it starts to melt the degree of disorder increases and if liquid water is the maximum degree of disorder then in this glass we have the highest amount of disorder or the highest amount of entropy so the point here in this illustration is that entropy the amount of randomness or disorder increases as ice melts and it makes sense these the the water molecules here in this glass can interact with one another uh, they're flowing freely around the molecules as you've seen in the illustration from one of the other chapters in the water molecules in solid ice go nowhere right they they form this nice uh, geometric shape and they go nowhere they're crystalline and they don't they're immovable however once they start to melt and then the water molecules uh, are released and they can flow around and, and interact that's randomness that's entropy all right here's another quick check Here's the statement. As the energy of a system decreases, the blank in the system increases. All right. Think about what we just talked about. Your choices are entropy, order, enthalpy, potential. So as the energy of a system decreases, what in the system increases right remember energy potential energy is maximum order we call that by the way enthalpy so if you answered entropy then you are correct so as as the system becomes more random as energy is released from the system things become more random entropy increases okay so remember that chemical bonds increase order right when things are bound together they're um, okay there's they're solid immovable I mean they're not really immovable right but uh, the idea here is they're fixed for at least a certain amount of time so order is increased heat increases disorder so when you heat something up when you boil water disorder when you melt ice disorder when you go out and exercise in the hot sun disorder living systems are always in flux between order and disorder order by the way is that enthalpy term that I used before entropy enthalpy it's back and forth order disorder um, enthalpy entropy 
We have another term for energy. It's called free energy. We also refer to this as Gibbs free energy, named after the person who first described this type of energy. We generally just refer to it as free energy. It's a total amount of energy in a system now available for doing work. It's obvious it's frequently abbreviated delta or delta G. That stands for the change in energy or the change delta G change in Gibbs free energy okay or in other words if you see delta G we're referring to free energy that's the amount of energy available for doing work so biochemical reactions change the free energy obviously right because you have energy in chemical bonds like the pyrophosphate bonds of ATP you break the bond you release you break the bond that releases energy, which then can be used to do work. So reactions with regard to energy and the re release of energy and the absorption of energy, reactions may be endergonic or extragonic. Now look at this. Endergonic reactions require the addition of energy. We have to input energy into the system. That's the ender part. Ender think about ender or endo or inside right these are reactions that require an input of energy we have to add energy to the system they they therefore cannot happen spontaneously okay so your car just doesn't start moving on its own you have to turn that thing on you have to get the pistons firing you have to start the gas burning and then you can do work then you can drive the car so you have to do something you have to input energy to the system versus extragonic exer or exo means an output or to put out of or outside of so extragonic reactions release energy so when the reaction happens energy is released for an endergonic reaction, you have to add energy to do the work, to make the reaction occur. Extragonic reactions, when they happen, they release energy. And so therefore, they may happen spontaneously. That'll make more sense in a second. So endergonic reactions, a nice illustration here. Energy of the products here, uh, rather here, products, is greater than the energy of the reactants here. So this is Gibbs free energy. So the energy of the products, remember, we, we add the reactants together and we make the products. That's the reaction. The energy of the products is greater than the energy of the reactants. So look at it this way. In order to go from here, this is the energy level of the reactants, to up here, right this is like climbing a hill we have to go we have to move up so the reaction we say is uphill right we have we're going from here to there so we have to go uphill so the energy must be added to must be added for the reaction to proceed the delta g or the change in gibbs free energy is greater than zero delta G greater than zero, which means that energy must be added to the system to cause the reaction to proceed. We must put energy into the system. That's the endergonic part. That's the ender part of endergonic, okay? It's an uphill reaction versus the extragonic reaction. Here, the energy of the products, way down here, is less than the energy of the reactants. So this is like the person standing at the top of the hill with the boulder or the big bowl and rolling the ball downhill. So we say the reaction is downhill because once you cross the threshold, the, re the reaction occurs spontaneously. It automatically happens. It's like gravity pulling the ball down the hill, right? You push the ball over the edge, gravity takes a hold. You can't stop the ball. You can't stop the snowball from rolling down the hill. It happens automatically. So in other words, energy is released as the reaction proceeds, right? We have lots of potential energy here. Once you go over the edge, over the threshold, the energy automatically happens 
and the energy therefore is being released from the system Potent lots of potential energy here we have energy in motion as we as the reaction proceeds when we make these products and it happens automatically we don't have to do anything to it so the change in Gibbs free energy is less than zero no energy is required to cause a reaction to proceed it happens automatically because the energy of the products is much much less than the energy of the reactant reactants it's a downhill scenario here so here's a little chart that may help you remember endergonic versus extragonic reactions okay endergonic reactions have a positive delta G remember that gives free energy extragonic reactions have a negative delta G endergonic reactions we have to add energy to the system which means that they're uphill direction of the reaction and extragonic reactions they happen spontaneously which means that are downhill energy in endergonic reactions must be supplied that's the ender or endo part with regard to the extragonic reactions energy is released that's the X or XO part and endergonic reactions are obviously not spontaneous because they're uphill whereas extragonic reactions are spontaneous because they're downhill here's a quick check reactions that proceed spontaneously where the Delta G gives free energy is less than zero that means the energy of the reactants is much less than the energy of the products we call those react we call those what kind of reactions your choices are endergonic catalyzed reactions explosive reactions or exergonic reactions well they proceed spontaneously we do not have to add energy to the system as the reaction proceeds re energy is released is let out of the system that's obviously the extragonic scenario finally we have the activation energy now activation energy think about the terminology here. it's energy required to activate something and what are we talking about in biochemical systems we're talking about biochemical reactions so it's energy that is necessary to begin a biochemical reaction remember the extragonic scenario right requires an input of energy what in what kind of energy is that that's your activation energy so it's the amount of energy needed to start a biochemical reaction and here's a thought for you if you um, if you ate something and you didn't have some way to speed up your reactions right to digest the hamburger that you had for lunch for example it would take you millions of years to break down that hamburger and extract the energy from it so that you could then in turn turn around and go run your marathon it would take millions of years literally it would take so long that you would be dead long before that hamburger was processed and you could extract the energy so in biochemical systems we have these things called catalysts catalysts are substances added to a system to lower the activation energy so in other words to make it make the metabolism or rather the catabolism of that hamburger occur you need to add energy it doesn't happen spontaneously that energy is activation however in the normal scenario you're adding you're adding the energy the, the energy to cause the catabolism of the hamburger to occur to be activated it is such a slow process that it would take you millions of years to digest and catabolize that hamburger so biochemical reactions make use of these substances called catalysts they are proteins 
We'll talk more about catalysts by way of enzymes in the next lesson. But these are substances that add to a system to lower the activation energy. So instead of taking a million years to digest and process your hamburger, now it takes only a couple of hours. So here is your um, little graph here with Gibbs free energy on this side. Course of the reaction going to the right here. So in an uncatalyzed reaction, that's the little blue line here, we start out at this level, whatever it is, and we don't really care what this number is at this point to digest your hamburger. Um, the energy, we have to add energy to the system because it's endergonic, and eventually we'll get to the point where the, ener the reaction can occur and we can digest the hamburger. That point, or the amount of energy that you must add to get to that point, is called the activation energy. All right. Now, this is going to take a very, very long time to get up to this point, so that the ener so that the reaction can proceed. It takes a long time. So, in order to decrease the amount of time so that that reaction occurs quicker, faster, in a shorter period of time, we add a catalyst. And when we add a catalyst, it takes the activation energy from here to there. It doesn't seem like a lot on this graph, but in biochemical systems, it's a lot. We're talking about millions of years, right? So we're reducing the activation energy. Remember, that's the amount of energy required to make the reaction proceed. We're taking it from here to there. And when we do that, that reaction now proceeds quickly, quickly. And that hamburger gets digested, broken down and digested in a matter of hours rather than a matter of millions of years. Here's the activation energy with a catalyst present. Here's the activation energy without a catalyst. You can see the difference, okay? So a catalyst decreases the activation energy or the amount of energy required to make the reaction proceed. Okay, so what is all this talk about energy about? It's about ATP. Adenosine triphosphate. Remember, this is the energy currency of the cell, and I've used that phrase before, and is something that you want to remember. ATP is three phosphate groups, and you know a phosphate group as a phosphorus molecule, that's the P with four oxygens attached, and it's three of these phosphate groups attached together in tandem to adenine by way of ribose. And again, ATP, adenosine triphosphate, and you want to remember this forever, is the energy currency of the cell. Now, ATP occurs in a cycle within the organic system, within, the, within your body, for instance. Okay? You do not make a whole lot of energy at any one time. You do not store a whole lot of energy at any one time. However, you constantly need energy to survive, to live. Even when you're sleeping, you need energy. So where does all that energy come from? Well, your body has a great uh, program of recycling energy, and here's how that works. It's called the ATP cycle. Here's ATP, obviously described or obviously uh, represented as this like sunburst or this burst of light representing energy. Energy, that's ATP. And remember, you have a high amount of potential energy conserved in the pyrophosphate bonds of ATP. Those are the bonds that connect one phosphate group to the next phosphate group to the next phosphate group, okay? Those are pyrophosphate bonds. Lots of potential energy stored in those bonds. How do we break, break covalent bonds? I'll give you a second. Hydrolysis, hydrolysis. We lyse the bonds by adding water. So we take ATP, a molecule of ATP, 
we add a molecule of water, we break the pyrophosphate, the terminal pyrophosphate bond, the, the, la the last one or the, the first one, however you want to look at it. It's the one, the furthest one away from the adenosine. We break that bond by adding water and we release energy. This is energy for endergonic cellular processes or this is your uh, endergonic reaction or this is the energy release so that you can drive an endergonic reaction, a reaction that requires energy. For instance, for example, um, uh, active transport. Remember when we talked about active transport, that requires an input of energy. Where does that energy come from? ATP. Active transport is an endergonic reaction. It's moving substances from an area of low concentration to an area of high concentration. It's pushing yourself into that crowded room takes energy, takes effort. Where does that energy come from? ATP. That's an endergonic reaction. Then that free phosphate here, you see it here, is recycled in the milieu. Now, when you take off, this is ATP, adenosine triphosphate. When you take off one the phosphate, then you have a phosph then you have the uh, phosphate with, uh, then you have the adenosine with two phosphates connected. We call that now ADP, adenosine diphosphate. If you take off another phosphate, then you have AMP, adenosine monophosphate. Okay, so once you remove the, pyro the phosphate group by adding water to break the pyrophosphate bond, then you turn this into ADP, adenosine diphosphate. There remains in the milieu and the phosphate now, which is free flowing, once the endergonic reaction or endergonic process occurs, then that phosphate, that free phosphate can recirculate, reattach to ADP to make a new molecule of ATP. So we, we use the energy in the pyrophosphate bond by driving an endergonic reaction and then through um, the synth synthesis process we form ATP by connecting, by reconnecting that pyrophosphate bond. Right? And we turn ADP back into ATP. This is energy derived from extergonic cellular processes. All right, we call this the ATP cycle. It's ATP, we break a bond by adding water. We use the energy from the phosphate to drive an endergonic reaction. The phosphate then gets reattached to ADP to make ATP, and that energy then can, can then be used to drive another endergonic reaction. So we have the circle, and that's how your body um, always has a supply of energy. Right? We, don't, we don't make a lot at one time, we don't store a lot at one time, but we always have this cycle going on. So we're always um, conserving, we conserve energy, right? We break it down, uh, we use it, we put it back together, right? We, we have this cycle going on all the time. All right, so the pyrophosphate bonds are high energy bonds. Hydrolyzing the terminal bond releases energy, which may then be coupled to a reaction, an endergonic reaction, to do work, like active transport. Here's the, the reaction that you're familiar with. Here's ATP, add a water to it, turns to ADP, releases that terminal phosphate. That energy can be used to drive an endergonic reaction, and then, according to the cycle, the phosphate group is reattached to ADP, and we're back to ATP. Phosphate group is attached to ADP with a concurrent release of water, and back to ATP. That's why this arrow goes both ways. So the energy here, when you break ATP, is used to drive endergonic reactions, and the cells use ATP cyclically, and so therefore we do not store ATP to any um, any degree long term. Obviously, when marathon runners the night before the race they go out and they 
uh, carb load eat lots of spaghetti and lots of bread and lots of pizza they're storing fuel which they will then use to make ATP so they can run 26.2 miles so you store the fuel but you don't store the energy okay quick check when the terminal pyrophosphate bond of ATP is blank, energy is released. All right. So we're going to do something to the terminal pyrophosphate bond of ATP to release energy. What are we doing to that bond? That bond is when that bond is catalyzed, we release energy. Hydrolyze is your, one of your choices. Synthesized is one of your choices, and simonized is one of your choices. <laughs> Obviously, it's not simonized. I just threw that in there because I couldn't think of another ized word. All right, so we're going to cleave the terminal phosphate bond. How do you cleave it? Hydrolysis. You add water. Hydrolysis. So if you answer it, hydrolyze, you're absolutely correct. So now this says let's go to the video and if when I'm teaching this class live I actually present the video to my students which I cannot do here but here is the link it's a YouTube video called ATP or adenosine triphosphate it's a pretty good simple little very short a video on ATP and how it is used or how it is tapped to drive endergonic reactions in living systems I put this link in your um, little list of things under module three. So you want to make sure you go and watch that short little video. It's just a couple of minutes long. Finally, this is just kind of a review um, of extragonic and endergonic reactions to kind of uh, prepare us for going into the next part of chapter six okay so here we see the energy of the reactants and the energy of the products here we see a very stable uh, molecule consisting of three glucose molecules this is a trisaccharide uh, everything is connected together everything is linked together everything is bound together with covalent bonds very ordered We add energy into the system, we break those bonds, we release those three little glucose molecules, the concurrent release of energy. This is the typical exergonic reaction, right? We're releasing energy. Energy is released, it happens spontaneously. Entropy increases. So if you can look at a graph like that or describe a reaction in terms of the amount of energy released, in terms of whether it happens spontaneously, in terms of the amount of entropy, whether that is whether entropy increases or decreases, and the idea that the energy of the products is different from the energy of the reactants, then you, you put the nail in the coffin with regard to extragonic reactions. So here we, extragonic, we're releasing energy. So here we are forming ATP, right? We're releasing energy. So here we're taking the phosphate, the terminal phosphate, and add it back to ADP to release energy, which is ATP. Now, versus the endergonic reaction, ender, right? by definition we have to add energy to there so here's your ATP we're going to um, cleave that terminal phosphate bond right and we need energy to do that here are your three little glucose monomers we need to add energy to the system because the energy of the reactants is lower than the energy of the products so it's an uphill reaction once we add energy then we can form those 
glycosidic bonds again and make that trisaccharide all over again. So we have to add energy to the system to do that. That's your endergonic reaction. Energy is required. It is not spontaneous. And entropy decreases. We go from an, um, a, a place where we, have, where we were completely in disorder, in disarray, and we go to a much ordered system with the trisaccharide here. Okay? That is the end of this lesson, the first lesson of Chapter 6, and we'll continue.